This is the Udahan presentations. Prime Minister Modi's advice to the working groups was to not only provide theoretical policy suggestions, but to also identify practical examples or udaharans of best practices that support our policy suggestions. These udaharans, even if at a smaller scale, are proof that the suggestions we contribute can and do work at the practical level. Earlier this year, we announced a call for udaharans that capture the essence of how civil society in India and across the world has implemented meaningful changes in education and digital transformation. We were amazed by how many incredible udaharans were submitted. And I think we should just give everyone a round of applause for the amazing work that everyone is doing across the world. We were amazed to see how many incredible udaharans were submitted and we are honored today to showcase just a few of these incredible and inspiring examples. I just want to make a quick reminder for the uh, presenters. We have unfortunately a five minute limit for each of the presentations because we really need to be on time for the next program. So uh, just please ensure that you are within the five minutes. We'll also be putting up a little sign that says you have one minute left and 30 seconds left, and then we should be okay moving on. So I'll go ahead and announce the first Udahan presentation. Our first Udahan presentation is by Mr. Arun Fernandez, who is a renowned social entrepreneur and the founder of D-Learners, an organization dedicated to celebrating and empowering different learners, particularly those with dyslexia. Mr. Arun, the stage is yours. Thank you so much for this opportunity, for the organizers. Yeah, and the first video, please. Yeah, uh, after a long, good, sumptuous lunch, I give you an activity. Please, all of you all read this. Read it. Play. Read it loudly and clearly. Not able to? Why? Concentrate. Clearly you should read. You're not concentrating. You're, you, should, you should focus better, then only you can be able to read. Now all of you all will be able, will be able to read. So uh, now see me. Am I looking disabled? Visibly at least? No? So go to the next slide, please. The, this is what is the invisible disability in India. It's about 35 million children. And I'm also one among them because I had a very uh, roller coaster life for my schooling. I uh, changed seven different schools to complete my schooling. Every school, I used to write my papers. And as any other student, I used to write my papers and uh, I used to submit. And uh, it was seven, eight pages I will submit. And I used to have all the answers orally correctly. But when I write, the teachers don't understand my answers. So whose mistake it is? Is it my mistake or the teacher's mistake? Hmm? Anyway, so uh, basically the written concept, whatever I was writing in an examination sheet, even though answers were known to me, I was not able to get the right marks. That was the journey, what I started with. So there's also a lot of uh, allied things to it. There's a lot of stigma attached to it, a lot of parental denial, access and affordability. As a solution, as a dyslexic, what we have, I've created is, n next slide please. So it's a past platform. We wanted to kind of put together all what is from identification to intervention in their own houses. So there is a lot of stigma going to be eradicated through that. So here, uh, what is the first thing is, is awareness to this whole scenario. Because lot, not, not many parents really understand the problem or the, they are not aware of this problem. So for that, we have created a lot of videos. Then early identification, usually in our academic system, we, after 8th standard only, these, uh, we spot these children as not performing well. But why can't we do it very early? 
then intervention should be easier and fun. Uh, when I was in third standard, they used to give me intervention classes using flashcards. So uh, I was in third standard. That, um, that, that, that time only I was one asked to let a sound association say, uh. I'm, it was actually detrimental for me. Why? Because most of my friends outside were able to read big sentences, big paragraphs, but I was not able to. So that intervention module was a little difficult to adapt for me. So what I created is, since it's only four minutes, there's a whole journey wherein a child can be empowered within their own schools, which can happen from online awareness creation, from teacher's checklist, parents' checklist, and the child can actually be screened from, school, from their own houses. Then the identi uh, early identification, this is not a remedial uh, certificate, but it's more of an early identification. I'll just give the last video, please. a blended session wherein it can be interesting for children. This is activity games. Brain gym, then the report comes follows by that. All this is structured and given as reports. Then there's reading tools which actually enables the child to read better. And there are worksheets given to them which is more fun. And it is barcoded wherein the teacher can actually access the actual worksheet what they have written. Then parent circle and so on. And this particular platform is now being fu uh, funded by Microsoft and we are, we are uh, since I have less time, I cut the video. So it's been funded by Microsoft and we are now Pan-India in six different states. Then uh, direct parents are also there, wherein they kind of see uh, promotional videos which we create and uh, they can download an app called uh, D-Learner's Parent App. From their own houses itself, they can start intervention for the children. And uh, the screening is totally free for any child. Uh, so that is what is my presentation. My time is also over. Thank you so much for your Thank you, Mr. Arun, for that incredible presentation. Our next Udharan is by Mr. Ramu Mutangi, the visionary founder and CEO of SHG Technologies Private Limited, a company dedicated to revolutionizing assistive technology for the visually impaired. There are over 400 million people with moderate to severe visual impairment and around 50 million of these people are blind. Blind Vision Foundation in collaboration with SHG Technologies from Bangalore have designed an innovative device called Smart Vision Glasses which makes use of artificial intelligence and machine learning. The glasses can plug into a smartphone and assist the user to read text navigate around obstacles and recognize faces and objects. We have distributed over a thousand smart vision glasses to the visually impaired with the help of Vision Aid and Rotary Club. We have also provided training to medical professionals and volunteers to help the users make full use of the device.
Namashwayam, Namaskar to all of you. I am Ramu Mutangi and uh, founder and CEO of Blind Vision Foundation and also SG Technologies that put the, the glasses into the world. Okay, uh, just to give you a, uh, just, just to give you the number, there are totally 50 million blind people. These are totally blind and uh, there are about 320 moderate to severe visually impaired people. So that makes it about 370 million people. And I don't know, I mean, can we really imagine these things? So just to take a look at this, this is a picture taken in one of the, during one of my visits to a, a blind school. Look at their hands. Do you see any books in their hands? No. They don't have, they, are, they don't have any braille books or braille leaders. It's, they're very expensive. So if you really see what they, what they hear is what they learn. That is a sad state of affairs for the blind children in the schools. We'll go to the next, next slide, please. Yeah, uh, so what we thought, we will uh, we'll come out with some kind of a device. So what we did was, you know, you know this artificial intelligence, machine learning, and uh, machine vision, you know, it, it's all coming up. And we could not have thought of such a device about seven to eight years back. But now they are available. So what we did was we put a, a small camera here and a LIDAR. LIDAR is the one that gets, it finds out what, how, how far is an obstacle in front of a person who is walking. And there is a small flash also we put so that we get a uniform uh, reading conditions. So those are the things. And what it can do is it can find the things around you. Suppose I put on the glasses and then it tells me there are a group of people. Okay, it tells me in an auditory response since they can't uh, see what we put, well, we give a Bluetooth uh, headset, so it tells them. And then if they want to read any book, they can read a book in any language. In India. We support all Indian languages. They can read a book in Malayalam or Tamil or they can, book, they can read a book of any of their choice in any language they want. And the other thing is the walking. You know, if I want to walk around, it tells me there are steps down, and then I can walk, and there is a space there. Move to your right, move to your left, move to your right, like that. And uh, it does a face identification. Suppose I, I'm looking at Arun. Arun, it tells me there is a gentleman, about 40 years old, looking at you. And then I can tag his name. I can say, Arun. Then next time, Arun, when he comes in front of me, it says, Arun is in front of you. Okay, so our, this is our goal. We want to, and look at the children, we want to make them completely independent. And our goal is to help at least one million children in the next one decade. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Yeah, thank you. Our next presentation will be presented by Mr. S. Ramakrishnan, Padma Shri awardee and founder of Amar Seva Sangam, and Mrs. Navami Venkata Chalapati, lead of implementation enabling inclusion program, Amar Seva Sangam. Amar Seva Sangam is an organization dedicated to transforming the lives of disabled children and youth in India. Thank you for your presentation today. Namaskar. Good afternoon to all. Thanks to Amma for giving this opportunity to, to be in front of you. Amar Seva Sangam has been concentrating on physically and mentally challenged children and youths 
for the past 42 years. It is located near the famous waterfalls Kutalam in a village called Aikudi. It is in the border of Kerala, Shengota. We have developed a, a software called Enabling Inclusion. And uh, this is the brain change of our Sangam secretary, co-founder, and uh, is the, today he could not come because of some other engagement. So, with the help of this app, we have been concentrating on early intervention program for the zero to six years old children. We have been working in three districts in Tamil Nadu, Tengasi, Tannadwedi, and Tutukudi. With this software, our community rehabilitation workers they go to the villages and uh, it is a door service and the parents are very much motivated and uh, they are happy about it. Because of lack of uh, specialists like physiotherapists, occupational therapists, uh, speech therapists and uh, psychologists. Uh, this program is very cost effective and uh, parents are relieved from the stress because parents are motivated and they are taught by our workers about the rehabilitation. Even during this pandemic period, uh, we were very successful in our tele rehabilitation. Now our uh, colleague Naomani will make the presentation. Thank you. Next uh, thank you so much for this opportunity. My name is Naomani. Yeah. It is estimated there are about 2.3 million children with disabilities up to the age of six years in India. Next slide. There are about 72% of children with disabilities at the age of five years have never attended the schools or any education institution. If children with developmental disabilities are not given adequate early intervention services, their uh, problem will lead to lifetime consequences, prolonged exclusion and poverty. So, 68% of the children with disabilities living in the developing countries do not receive early intervention. This may be lack of rehabilitation professionals, remote countries or awareness, lack of awareness. Our solution is a community-based rehabilitation model where we have a group of rehab professionals in um, a particular region and training the parents. I just need one, two minutes to explain this one. No before slide. Okay, I'll explain. Here we have, uh, we do the developmental screening at uh, village, at village places using the standard scales and children with developmental disabilities are identified. So once the children are identified, the community rehab workers reach the child's family and explain about the child's condition. And with the families concerned, they take uh, assessments and uh, the children, they connect the uh, families with the rehab professionals, they set the goals with the families and teach the parents, coach the parents how to do the therapy for them. And this program is, end after six months, they evaluate the child's progress. This entire activity is monitored through an app called Enabling Inclusion App, which is developed in uh, Amar Seva Sangam. 
From the screening, assessments, uh, evaluation, and the intervention, we use standard protocols. And uh, enabling inclusion app, uh, it has two uh, type of uh, monitoring. One is program monitoring, where we can monitor how our programs are mo mo moving. Therapy, uh, medical camps, and everything, training, other things, and also monitoring the progress of the children. So from 2014 onwards, we are using this app, having more than 5,000 uh, 5, children reached in uh, districts. No, the one before. Okay. So we have identified with this type of early intervention and the model, the uh, school admi admission have moved from 69 percentage to 84 in different time. And also the children have progressed at least 10 percent in different domains. And thank you so much for this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you so much. The next Udaharan will be presented by Mr. Sapan Jain, Course Coordinator, and Ms. Pallavi Kulsheshta, Project Planning and Management Officer at the Haryana Welfare Society for Persons with Speech and Hearing Impairment. Uh, can we show the video first? There'll be a video by Sapan Jain. We always see textbooks in English and the other subjects, but we don't have ISL textbooks anywhere. That's disappointing. We don't want the same problem to continue. The good news is in National Education Policy 2020, Prime Minister has announced India Sign Language to be launched as a language subject. Fortunately, during that time in 2019, a team of deaf teachers and experts have created ISL textbooks which completely meet the need of deaf learners. These books were released by the Chief Minister and the Honourable Governor Haryana. From foundation to class 8, these books are completely ready for use. When deaf children look at these visually stimulating books, they are filled with joy and are able to bilingually work on their language. Deaf teachers are finding it easy to provide graded level of ISL instruction. These books have been taken to different deaf schools in the country and we've received immense positive feedback that they have never felt like this before. ISL has to be launched as a language subject, not just in Haryana, but across the country. All right, back to PPT. I hope everybody understood, right? Can we continue the presentation like that? I think that's the best way of doing this. So just wanted you to make sure how it feels to not have access. We're so used to access that even if like a one second, like, you know, not having access to what is being said or signed is disappointing. I'm Pallavi, uh, Sapan just informed you about the project. We're going to tell you why Indian Sign Language textbooks are extremely important because all languages are. Next slide, please. Uh, a brief about our organizations. We are from Haryana Welfare Society. We have eight centers. We have eight, thank you. We have eight centers and uh, we have been doing a lot of projects related to, sorry. Okay, I'm bad at this. Yeah, so uh, some of the projects are related to early intervention, which has, I think, been taught um, a lot in this conference. But the early intervention we are talking about starts with sign language, not without sign language, because language is the right of every child, including deaf children. For the schools, we have the DSL, Digital Sign Language Lab, which provides access to school curriculum, because teachers in our country don't know how to sign, but deaf children should not miss out on education just because of that. Okay, next slide. I, this is not working. Okay, yeah. So this is the sign library on YouTube, which you can uh, go and all the content, more than 800 videos are available 
with access even to you. It has captions, it has uh, audio, so you can access it even if you don't know sign language. One question, I want everybody's attention here. I want you to tell me at what age you learned your first language, your mother tongue, at what age? You can see the options on the screen. The first option is age zero to three, and the last option is above 15 years. When did you learn your first language? Zero to three, right? All the hearing people? Right. So the response from the hearing people is zero to three. All right. Now, I'll ask the deaf people in the crowd, when did they learn their first language? Sorry. I'm sorry, I am bad at this. Can you go to the previous slide? Yeah. So when, when do you think deaf children learn their language? Is it zero to three? No, it's not. And it's, it's more than uh, nine years, six years. So it's a lot of time passed and that leads to language deprivation. Next slide. To minimize that, that's why we have, next slide, the Indian Sign Language textbooks. That's what is announced in the national education policy, that it should be mandatory as a subject. Like you and I have access to our language, they should too. Next slide. These were launched by none other than the governor and the chief minister of Haryana. Next slide. So these are the books we have developed from early intervention to class eight, a set of 20 books. Next slide. Himanshu Kansal, the, uh, the photo that you see on the left, is the deaf designer behind this project. He has more than 1,000 visuals. Next slide. So these are some of the visuals. Indian Sign Language is a three-dimensional language. To make it into a textbook is very difficult. It took us two years during the COVID to develop this. Next slide. The characters have context. So it's not just the sign, it's also, like for an example, an apple is signing an apple. So the sign, is visually stimulating. A child would instantly understand what the sign means. Next slide. You can see it in these examples. Next slide. There is a code. Next. These are some examples of the sign. Next. Next. So if you want to see more, because there's no time, you can go to Google Books and search Indian Sign Language Class 1, Class 2, and you will find these books. But it's just a preview, if you want to purchase that, next slide. You can write to us and you can get a set. Especially in deaf schools, but even in hearing schools, it has to be taught by a deaf teacher who is an Indian Sign Language Certified Instructor. Next. Thank you. I hope I did it in time. Thank you. Thank you for that wonderful presentation. The next to the Heron presentation is by Mrs. Philomena Nayam Gallagher, who previously served on the Stonington City Council and worked with the Caroline Chisholm Society, a non-governmental organization in Australia. Om Namah Shivaya. I hope you can understand me and I hope I can make this presentation. I'm not used to making presentations. Excuse my faults. I'm going to speak briefly about the importance of early intervention and client consumer input into program development. I'm using as my example a special needs playgroup I was involved with in Melbourne, Australia. As, oops. Press the slide, yeah. As you can well imagine, families with children of special needs have a lot to adjust to. This can include medical and specialist interventions, which of course can be both invasive and traumatic. Parents are on a sharp learning curve coming to terms with their situation, learning about medical conditions, lifestyle requirements of the child, and also, of course, learning to ask for help. Uh -oh. 
sorry, learning to deal with technology. So this special needs playgroup was originally established about 40 years ago with the parents of children with disability. Parents are still involved with the service through a governing committee. The, pe the, the play group also includes having a parent support group where there's a lot of information sharing on various services, as well as providing a listening ear to the families. For many of the families, this can be the first time they've been able to speak about their journey. A support group is very important in helping to share gathered information quickly. Otherwise, families have to individually chase up all the available information. Too fast. The play group itself contains just a small number of children, 20 per session. There are two three-hour sessions per week. There's one-on-one -on -one adult input with physiotherapist, speech therapist, OT, kindergarten teacher, local council care staff, which was my role, and volunteers. Simple tasks are, in, are explored during play to encourage communication, movement, interaction, and of course, have fun. Also, the um, learning of independent self-care skills was encouraged, particularly in regards to feeding, toileting, or dressing skills. Um, you can well imagine that any of these um, skills will make things a lot easier for families as the child grows up. So what makes this play group work so well? I see three components of this project, program. One, I call the bones of the project, and that's the commitment for government and local council in providing funding, facilities, and staffing, and all financial input. The council actually provided some relief for families with in-home support by trained workers as well. Now, the flesh of the project has got to be the people involved. Um, their input gives enthusiasm, a sense of ownership, responsibility, and the drive for the continuous, uh, continuance of the program, particularly at time, difficult times during funding and policy changes. But the soul of the, of the project has got to be the kids themselves. Kids with disabilities bring so many people together in love and service, and their happiness and joy is infectious and enriches all around them. Towards policy development, I've identified three, three areas. And the first is the importance that all stakeholders make a commitment to the development of meaningful projects providing the best for children with special needs, particularly in the early years, and providing adequate facilities and funding for early intervention services. The second is engaging with families, and particularly the mothers who are often the primary caregivers, getting their feedback and taking note of their needs. And so developing support groups and teaching people how to recognize their own needs and also how to ask for help. All stakeholders should be well informed about what is needed, what's currently available. And ju just one last point I'd like to make. Often um, services seem to be very focused on the bones of the organization and a lot of time that could be spent on service provision is spent on making sure the funding and then the facilities are ongoing in this day and age with the amount of finance across the world, both in the developed and the developing country. This should not be the case. Thank you very much. Thank you so much.
The next to the hand presentation is my Mr. Sambujang Mare of Skill Development and Equity Education in Ghana. Uh, thank you so much uh, for this opportunity to showcase an incredible work uh, from an incredible organization that is created and headed by a phenomenal woman in the Gambia. Uh, I would just start by quoting a very popular phrase or statement as far as the Gambian context is concerned and that is, in order to successfully build your homeland, you must strive, walk, and pray so that f peace, freedom, and unity can be ensured each day. And that is exactly what this organization has set out to do in the Gambia. Can you uh, please play the slides? The organization is called Genjoro Skills Academy. It was uh, created in 2009 with the slogan to get the young people and vulnerable groups or marginalized people, especially women, off the streets. And what does this mean? This implies they offer competency-based training to young people, mostly on pro bono basis. They don't pay anything. And this competency-based training, what it ensures is it inculcates the right attitude when it comes to educational context that is the affectionate part, but also it ensures it gives these young people and women the right skills. That's the psychomotive aspect. But also it prepares their cognitive aspect, and that is the mindset, to be able to have the relevant knowledge and to be able to succeed in the 21st century. And as a result of this intervention of Genjoro Skills Academy, a lot of young people who normally take this irregular or illegal migration, the perilous journey to Europe, to the Canary Islands, to Italy, to Spain, it has succeeded in coping that a lot in the Gambia. It has trained more than 4,000 young people uh, since inception in the Gambia, mostly on pro bono basis, and almost 85% of them are in gainful employment. So that's, that's, that's a huge achievement. As a result, the lady behind it is called Fatusen. I have shared my presentation, but I don't know why actually they could not uh, live stream it for all of us to see. She is doing an amazing job. You know, she has empowered a lot of mothers who were just sitting down in homes doing nothing. She is able to convince them to come on board and give them the right skills in tailoring, in hairdressing, in catering, in beads making, in carpentry and joinery, etc., etc. And today, most of those guys are able to earn sustainable livelihoods through those skills that they have acquired uh, through the Gain Your Skills Academy. So, uh, without much ado, I would just stop here if, are you able to get the presentation? Uh, at least the, the video is also shared. Uh, okay, okay, then maybe towards the end you can do that. Okay, without much ado, uh, let me just stop here. Thank you so much once again.
Thank you, Mr. Sambujang. Our next presentation will be presented by Virginie Blackard, a French educator on the board of directors for IUD Europe. Ayud is uh, embracing the world's youth movement. Ayud Europe was uh, founded in 2005 and has volunteers all across Europe and beyond. Over 10,000 people have been involved in our activities. Ayud seeks to empower young people to make social and political change for more inclusive and peaceful societies through self-development, inner transformation, and collective action. We're striving to develop compassionate leaders with a sense of tolerance, solidarity, and global responsibility. There are two main sets of activities in IUD Europe. Uh, if we can get this slide. So the, the first is the annual summit Every year, there is a, a gathering of more than 150 young people in Europe, in Germany, usually. So, IUD Europe has held 17 international youth summits and gathering people from 25 countries. Last year, it was our first gathering after the two years of pandemics. Uh, we had 150 participants. The summit was a great success. Uh, the young people said they had uh, found a new home, new family, a new hope for the future. They were very inspired. And during this summit, um, some uh, youth, panel, youth policy panels are held, in which very important topics were addressed, like mental health, for example, which is a, a big topic nowadays, especially after COVID and you know, the war in Ukraine, who's, which just started just before the, the last summit. The role of education in developing youth resilience, environment sustain, sustainability, or building a sense of global community. These summits have received the financial support of the European Commission. So I think it's not working. The second set of activities are um, national activities going out throughout the year uh, by national groups in all European countries, many European countries. These activities are mainly tree planting, social projects for homeless people, uh, refugees or visiting the old, old age homes, many songs, albums, videos and live shows allowing the youth to express their talents and their creativity. We also welcome long-term volunteers in a French center sponsored by the European Commission. There was a video to, so we, I want to show you a video that announces the next summit, which is the European Youth Forum that will take place in August this year. Dare to dream. Together, we will embrace the unknown and find ourselves. Together, we will build, create, and innovate at the IUD European Youth Forum. Dare to dream, act, and impact. Join us at the IUD European Youth Forum and make your dreams a reality. Dare to dream of a world without discrimination. Dare to dream of a world where our ideas can change lives. For six unforgettable days in Germany, you'll be surrounded by like-minded individuals from all across Europe, sharing your passions and working together to make a difference in your communities and the world. Dare to dream of a world where every voice is heard. Our expert-led activities will enhance your skills and foster the exchange of knowledge and attitudes, helping you become a young leader at the local, national, and European levels. Dare to dream of a world where we can conquer our fears. Together, we can turn our dreams into reality. Join us at the IUD European Youth Forum, and together, 
will create a brighter future for ourselves and generations to come. Let's turn our dreams into actions and have a lasting impact on the world. Thank you. Thank you. Our next presentation will be Mr. K. Anwar Sadat, prominent figure in the educational technology sector, serving as the CEO of Kerala Infrastructure and Technology for Education, or KITE, a government enterprise in Kerala, India. Good afternoon. Video, please. EQ. In Kerala, all school teachers are trained to handle IT and ICT-enabled learning activities as part of their teaching learning process. There are no separate teachers for handling IT or ICT at school level. IT has been a compulsory subject for secondary school students since 2002-2003. Department of General Education, Government of Kerala, started IT activities in school education in 2001 with a mission mode project called IT at School and now it is a Kerala Infrastructure and Technology for Education KITE. IT has been a compulsory subject for SSLC examination since 2005. Department imparts special ICT training for existing teachers who handles IT subject and their own subjects by using the facilities of ICT in schools. Nearly 70,000 teachers were trained in implementing the use of e-language labs in schools in 2022. E-language lab, eCube English software developed by Kite in Force platform has been initiated in all elementary schools for promoting the enhanced learning of English of students. This software provides an opportunity for children to do learning activities through gaming and in an interactive way. During the COVID pandemic, Kite Victors, the educational channel, utilized AR, VR, virtual lab facilities for telecasting school classes from 1 to 12. Presentation, please. So this is uh, one of uh, one among of many initiatives we thought of presenting EQ because this is an open source and this can be taken to any states or any institutions. Basically, this is uh, uh, EQ is a program which uh, has uh, enjoy, enhance, and enrich any language. This is started for English, and uh, it has three components. One is the library, which is the digital repository part. The second part is broadcast, which we do in our uh, broadcast channel called Kite Victors. Uh, then the third one is the language lab. I want to stress upon the language lab part. The existing language lab is proprietary, and it's, uh, it's not the policy. Kerala has taken a policy that only free and open source software will be used in school education. It's an exclusive arrangement. And if we use the proprietary sort of things in schools, we may spend starting from 30 to 300 to 320 to 1,600 crores. So we want to, and the restrictions and the use of license and all. So basically, we started piloting this in 14 diets uh, in 1819. Then uh, it's evolved in 2001, February. So if you see the highlight, this does not require any additional uh, hardware. All schools have equipped with broad, uh, laptops and projectors, so existing laptops can be used and the software can be piggybacked on that. No internet is required and uh, uh, it can make any modification, you can tune it with the curriculum. There is uh, uh, sort of uh, other advantage. It has both student login, uh, parent login and the teacher login, it's exclusively there. And the process now which uh, have uh, um, listening, speaking, reading and writing, it's starting from that then uh, uh, various engagement activities for students like uh, kissing, interaction, assignments and all. This is a study conducted recently, the report is yet to come for the final study. This is by the Regional Institute of English 
uh, which is under NCRT along with IT for Change Bangalore. So this is, these are the learning. I, will, I can share the presentation. I don't want to elaborate the detail. And if you see the scalability and growth, this can be done for uh, uh, any languages. We started with English, and this will be for Malayalam, Kannada, Tamil, Hindi, etc. And it, it can be catered to any extent. See, Kerala has been using free and open source exclusively, and we have saved 3,000 crore rupees by using force. Uh, this has been treated by the former uh, Nidhi Ayok uh, CEO Amitabh Chan on that. And this is the type of uh, 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 activities in pipeline. We have the language lab in 1 to 8. In uh, coming two years, it will have 9 to 12. And then it will be expanded by 2060. This will be available in North States. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. The next Udahran will be presented by Ms. Maribel Perez Roche, professor and tutor at the Open University of Catalonia in Spain. She is a seasoned professional with over 25 years of experience in NGOs, foundations, associations, and public administration in Spain. Ms. Tapasi will be translating from Spanish to English for us. Thank you. Namashivaya. Uh, os presentamos la línea de apoyo telefónico Escuchar desde el corazón. This is a telephone line service called Listening from the Heart. Es un servicio gratuito que ofrece la Fundación Mata Amrita Nanda Mayi Center Spain, gestionado por personas voluntarias, inspirado por AMA. This is a free service offered by the MA Center Spain Foundation managed by volunteers and inspired by AMA. Se desarrolló previamente en India e Inglaterra durante la pandemia del COVID, pero en España se adaptó la realidad del país y a una época post-COVID. It was previously developed in India and England during the COVID pandemic, but adapted to the Spain reality of the country and to a COVID, post-COVID era. Está dirigido a la comunidad en general y ofrece apoyo a personas que sufren soledad, aislamiento o necesitan ser escuchadas y disponen de teléfono. It is aimed at the community at large and offers support to people who are lonely, isolated or need to be heard and have a telephone. Esas personas, las personas acompañadas, llaman a la línea de apoyo para solicitar el servicio de acompañamiento telefónico. These people, which we call the accompanied person, call the helpline to request the telephone service. Lo que ofrece el servicio es que un voluntario o voluntaria la llamará un día y a una hora pactados, una vez a la semana, durante una hora o dos veces media hora, como máximo durante un año. The service offers a volunteer who will call the person on an agreed day and time for one hour a week or half an hour, twice a week, and for a minimum, a maximum, sorry, of a year. La persona acompañada puede dejar el servicio cuando quiera, puede pedir un cambio de voluntario, o después de un año, si desea, eh, puede seguir con el acompañamiento con una persona nueva. The accompanied person can leave the service whenever he or she wants, and can ask for a change of the volunteer at any time. But if after a year she wishes to continue with the service, a new volunteer will be assigned to them. El equipo gestor del servicio se subdivide en diferentes equipos que realizan diversas tareas. Coordinación general, equipo de selección y gestión del voluntariado, equipo de primeras llamadas, informática y seguridad del sistema, formación, coordinación de apoyo y emergencias. The service management team is subdivided into different groups which perform different tasks such as a general coordination, volunteer selection and management team, a first call team, IT and system security, training supervision and emergencies. Los voluntarios reciben formación online específica en habilidades comunicativas, sobre todo en escucha activa, confidencialidad, Límites en la relación de escucha y seguridad. 
Volunteers receive specific online training in communication skills, especially in active listening, confidentiality, boundaries, and safety. Las personas acompañadas deben ser mayores de 18 años, no tener problemas de salud mental, no tener problemas de droga adicción ni ideaciones suicidas y facilitar un mínimo de datos personales para realizar la llamada con la máxima seguridad. The accompanied person must be over 18 years old with no mental health problems, no drug addiction, no suicidal ideation and provide a minimum of personal data to make the call with maximum security. Estas limitaciones del servicio se dan para proteger tanto a la persona acompañada como a los voluntarios y al servicio en sí. These boundaries have been set up to protect the accompanied person, the volunteers and the service. Todas estas problemáticas mencionadas anteriormente deben ser tratadas por profesionales y así se le explica a las personas cuando llaman pidiendo información. All the above should be dealt by professionals, therefore, it is explained to people when they call for information. Los voluntarios escuchan atentamente, con empatía, con presencia. No dan orientaciones, ni consejos, ni opiniones. No intentan resolver problemas. Volunteers listen attentively, with empathy. They do not give guidance, advice, or opinions and they do not try to solve problems. Los voluntarios tienen un coordinador de apoyo que supervisa las llamadas, tanto hablando directamente con ellos como a través de un registro escrito que realizan los voluntarios en una plataforma online. Volunteers have a person from the management team and a support coordinator who monitors the calls in a secure online platform. Los coordinadores de apoyo están a entera disposición de las personas voluntarias para tratar cualquier tema que surja uh, del desarrollo de su tarea o con el ánimo de cuidarlos, protegerlos y ofrecer un máximo de calidad. The support coordinators are at the full disposal of the volunteers to deal with any issues arising in the spirit of caring for them, protecting them and offering the highest possible quality service during the conversations. A lo largo del proyecto se proponen encuentros online aproximadamente cada tres meses para fomentar la pertenencia a un equipo y complementar la formación con temas de interés. Throughout the project, online meetings happen every three months to encourage team development and to provide ongoing training with topics of interest. Evaluamos el servicio con los testimonios que las personas acompañadas expresan directamente al servicio. Los voluntarios recogen estos testimonios al final del servicio o al finalizar el año pactado. We evaluate the service solely by the testimonies that the accompanied person expresses to the service. The volunteers collect these testimonies at the end of the service or after a year has elapsed. Hasta el momento, todos los testimonios han sido muy positivas y os queríamos mostrar un par de ellos en pantalla. Up to date, all the testimonies have been very positive and we wanted to show you a couple of them. Muchas gracias. Loka Samasta Sukino Babantu. Gracias. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Our next presentation will actually be online. Uh, this presentation will be by Ma Ms. Mathilde Everare, President of the International, uh, President and International Coordinator, as well as co-founder of Floresta TV by O Organismo Brazil. Good morning, everybody from early morning in Brazil. Can you hear me well? I suggest yes, okay. Uh, can we first uh, start with uh, the video of the indigenous leaders of Amazonia, please? We're getting the video ready and we can hear you loud and clear. Okay. 
uh, well, so just the time the video is ready, like just for introducing maybe myself and the video. So my name is Mathilde. Uh, I'm from France, but I'm talking with you from Brazil, where I'm living now for eight years uh, in direct contact with indigenous community, uh, mainly from Amazonia, but also from all South America. And uh, from this contact, um, I started to develop uh, not only a way of being with them and studying with them, uh, a whole universe and a way of thinking, a way of living as a society, but also starting to uh, think how to exchange and uh, empower their voice uh, inside the global world. And for that, we started to use with them uh, digital tools and Web3 tools uh, for that happening. So I think the video is ready. So if you can share it, uh, I will explain a bit later. Thank you. Fago parte aí de lu. Em Harazi Kalimã. Eu vou baitar na gente na vida. Fago parte aí de lu. Em Harazi Kalimã. Eu vou baitar na gente na vida. Sago pa chay shibu, ni hawa ta sarim da aki, yoko bi uta na ni ta na bina. Sago pa chay shibu, ni hawa ta sarim da aki. Ni kuta sari daka ke, nuku dewi tara ni tara bi dewi. Well, the video ended just a bit before the end, but uh, I think it's okay. Uh, since there will be a, a longer version of this video that I think quite reason well what we are doing and believe uh, with indigenous people, uh, not only from Amazonia, but from uh, all the world, um, and which is the aim of our organization. So now if you can uh, put the presentation um, so that I can uh, show also with some picture what we're doing. So. Uh, organiz uh, our NGO called Organismo uh, has uh, as purpose to unify knowledge, technologies, talents, wisdom and institution with the purpose of co-creating regenerative solutions gathered on universalist values, way of life and broader mindset of the traditional communities, people and culture of the five continents. And uh, we believe that uh, this knowledge empowered by technological and decentralized know-how allow the natural emergence of systemic solutions of governments, education, environment, and economical global system. And um, so the movie, yes, so you, we can go on the other page. So um, this uh, short movie actually uh, has been made uh, in, in partnership with a C20 organization. Uh, so it has to bring the voice of indigenous people uh, inside uh, the, the C20 uh, stage. Uh, because like uh, few people know about this uh, huge diversity of people, but today they represent uh, more than uh, 500 ethnic groups 5% of the population, which preserve 80% uh, of our biodiversity. So from that, we believe that we have a lot of things to do and to learn with them. It's hard to define and uh, even less uh, resume uh, such a diversity in five minutes or even more, but we can see really like uh, many common values between all the people and all this uh, diversity such as a vision of a whole interconnected world where nature is part uh, of them and the whole. And from that, they have really a sustainable system that they maintain for centuries, and not only for them, but for the whole planet. And they also live through an abundant paradigm that from them, um, we need to see abundance in nature and believe in it so that we create it. 
and doing it as a collective and decentralized society where uh, the whole is more important than the individuality. And for that, one of the main way to pass our regeneration is taking care of educational traditional system and also, also promoting all, uh, always union of people, union of ethnic groups and interconnectivity of other ethnic groups. So we, from that, we start and try to see how we can be inspired as global world uh, by this voice, by this system, and how we can also import the voice and solution to our own solution. So we can go to the last page. Uh, so um, uh, from, the, from this perspective, so um, we had this opportunity to bring in these uh, digital tools inside uh, tribes of Amazonia and other countries and uh, really uh, having the opportunity we learn how we can maybe better use uh, this tool so as to empower um, traditional voice uh, so has to maintain uh, traditional culture so has to um, make preservation uh, of uh, land protection uh, help them uh, with uh, self-determination when we give them the tools and the way uh, of learning how to bring their own voice to the digital world uh, and also it's a basic human rights as they're also asking for uh, being connected to what's going on, on the planet uh, and for them it's possibility also to uh, scale up the solution and connect with all our projects so from that we believe that it's a mycelium of solutions that can uh, uh, happen and emerge even more with the uh, high technological tools that we have today like such as web tree and decentralized tool that can help really like to go much broader uh, with decentralized system uh, as a global tribe so now our work and i think it's our collective work is how we can um, learn with them uh, but also giving them access to the tools and support for that happening. That's my question, is that's what I hope we can make it together. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much for joining us online, Ms. Matilde Everari. Our final presentation for today is by Mrs. Geet Oberoi, founder, president of ORCIDS Foundation an international network of researchers, practitioners, and policy makers committed to improving educational practice and policy to enhance children's learning in preschool through primary years. Namaskar everyone. Aren't you glad I'm the last speaker? So after this really long long, almost really long day, and a fantastic lunch. I think all of us, uh, I for one, was dozing off. So before I go into the, uh, my five minute spiel, can I request everybody to stand up? Please, just put all your books and everything on the side, if you can. Sorry, 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 I'm sorry. All right, can everybody turn towards their right? Including the tech team, please. The tech team, can everybody stand up? Tech team, maths professor, thank you very much. Guys, everyone, can you please stand up? Please, please, huh? thank you. Everybody, turn to the right. Turn to your right, wherever your right is. Your right, your right. Everybody turn to your right. And can you put your hands on the shoulder in front of you? <laughs> you can move a little ahead if they're a little further off. Both your hands on the shoulders in front of you. Both your hands. All right? The tech team, please. Now give them a massage. Massage. You guys have been sitting for very long. Yeah. Now you can turn around. Thank you very much. I'll start now.
So my name is Dr. Geeta Baroy. I work in the field of specific learning disabilities in India. And I bring to you today a screening app. It's an app for SLD, children with SLD, or children who could be at risk as for SLD. This was made primarily not for special educators, not for psychologists. This was made for parents and more importantly for general ed teachers because those are the teachers who, need, who don't really know, who are not trained, who might not be aware of the nuances of what it means to have learning disabilities. The psychologists know it, the special educators know it, but there are only a handful of them as compared to the number of teachers in our country, right? So, like it says, the disability may be invisible, but the child is not. The child is in front of us, we can see the child. However, you cannot see the disability. Like Arun said the other day, not the other day, earlier in the day, that he has a disability, he looks fine. He talks fine, he walks fine. You look at him, you can't figure out that he may have SLD. I have dyscalculia, I have ADHD, it's not written on my forehead. We, it does not have a physical manifestation. You infer it from our mm, behaviors, from our performance. That's what LD is all about. You can't make out just by looking at a child. So it's invisible, right? So going. So it's called First Screen. It's a screening app for SLD and related concerns. It very readily picks up um, conditions like ADHD, mild, uh, mild autism, and also um, mild ID, which is intellectual disability. I'm not going to talk about what disability uh, SLD is. Ah, oh, man. Guys. Hello. So basically, the bold, what is in bold is what is the crux of SLD, right? It's the difficulty to comprehend, speak, read, write, spell, or do math. All the skills which we are expected to do in a school setup, most of the skills, right? So if, this are, if all of them, or one or two of them are effective, the child's basically, you know, he's lost out to begin with. So, so the scenario in our country is that Research indicates about 10 to 15 percent of school-going children may have SLD. By sheer number, our classrooms have about 35, 40 odd kids on an average. That means that at least four kids, at least four kids in each classroom may have SLD, and we have no freaking clue because it's not written here. You can't see it. So that's why we need to empower our gender-led teachers so they can catch them young. Like I was saying in the morning, if they are caught, they are taught. We have to catch them early. The law says a lot of things, but in a nutshell, it says that we will get, when I say we, I mean children with SLD, will get accommodations, we will get A, we'll get B, we'll get C, we'll get D. Ha, hey, hallelujah. However, there's no screening tool. The government of India says, screen all children. What do we screen them with? Lack of awareness. Parents don't know, teachers have no clue. Lack of accountability. The schools will call the parents and say, please take your child out. We are not equipped to handle, put him in a special school. And lastly, lack of trained pro professionals. No special educators trained in SLD. I mean, these are just the big, big uh, lacunas or challenges in our system. First screen was launched in 2020 by Dr. Jayanti Narayan, who I think most of you have already experienced in terms of her interaction and her thought process a brilliant lady who's been in the field for now dinosaur years. So this is what the first screen looks like. It's a free app, guys. 
nobody has to pay a penny. You just have to simply go on the Play Store and download it. But the only but is that as of now, it's for Android system. It is not for the iOS. It's a first time in our country, first free app, and it's for all. This is basically an introduction which I'm not going to go about, but just tells you the why and the how and the um, uh, war rooms and everything. This is right now available in two languages, English and Hindi. I'm just giving you images of how the app looks like when you download it, all right? So this is, it just tells you what it means. It tells you how to answer yes, no, or maybe. This is what uh, the items, which are 1 to 99, look like. No, yes, and sometime. The bar at the end, I mean at the bottom, needs to be just tapped and your answers are recorded. This is how the report looks like. It's a skill wheel, it's a skill indicator. My time's up. Push. Skill indicator, nine, we have nine um, domains. Red is concerns, yellow is not so much, and green is have a party, nothing wrong. Why? I've already spoken about all this. These are the domains which we cover. Reading, writing, oral language, math, motor skills, attention, social skills, executive functions, and memory. So it will give you an idea. Each and every child will get a visual report on the basis of which you can take further steps, whether the child needs to be just worked with, whether the child needs further investigation, does the teacher need me to do anything, does the psychologist needs to be involved. So at least the parents get a you know, a push to go on the right direction. And that's all what we're asking. Early intervention is that, that's all you need for early intervention to get on track. Uh, I've already spoken about this. Logins, since we started, have been 30,288. English screenings have been 21,000. Hindi have been 1,900. You see a discrepancy there because the teachers, the teach, if you're a teacher, you can do multiple screenings for children in the class. So, and you can also log in back and view the previous screening done. So that's why you see a discrepancy between the number of screenings and the total number of logins. I'm so sorry. And of course, the network to... glitches. Sorry. So sorry. So... <laughs> we may have to move on. Yes. But for whatever it's worth, two minutes that exercise also took, right? Right? <laughs> Thank you very much, guys. Namaskar. Thank you so much for that final Udarhan presentation. And I just want us all to give one final round of applause for all of these incredible Udaharans and all of the ones that were submitted. It's incredible work that's happening here in civil society. I just want to make a couple of announcements before we move on to the keynote addresses today. Uh, the first announcement is for tonight's cultural programs. We're incredibly lucky to have a, very, a great set of cultural programs for you all tonight. It will be happening at 6.30 here in this hall. Tonight's program will be Drishya Talam by South Zone Cultural Center, Tanjavur, Ministry of Culture, Government of India. The choreography for tonight's program provides a glimpse into the vast storehouse of South Indian cultural practices. This bird's eye view showcases Bharatanatyam from Tamil Nadu, Kuchipuri from Andhra Pradesh, Mohini Atam, Tiruvadragali, and Kadagali from Kerala, and multiple folk and martial art traditions. This program will also be followed by a traditional Attapadi tribal dance. So please stay tuned, please stay for tonight's cultural programs. I also want to make one quick announcement. We have a, a lost bag. I think it's one of the C20 bags that you got at the front, but it has a green bag inside. So if you can just check your bag to make sure you haven't taken somebody else's bag, there's a small green pouch inside the missing bag. 
If you find it, please, uh, you can bring it to the sound console and we'll try to figure out how we can get it. All right, from here, I think we're ready. Before we go into the keynote address, I, we have one video from today's Without Him presentations that we would like to play now. This is um, the video for Mr. Sambujang Mare, who we weren't able to play it earlier, but we'll have it for you right now. My name is Francis Gay, CEO of Gainjero Skills Academy. I am an international master trainer by UNTAD, and I also have my degree in finance. I have founded Gainjora in 2009 to empower young people, get them up to status with marketable skills, that will give them an opportunity to be self-independent and learn, thereby adding value to the national economy of our country. I offer skills training in tailoring and fashion, catering and home management, and hairdressing and beauty. I have three skill centers in the country, two in the rural and one in the urban. In the rural communities, we offer skills, demand skills in energy, in clay production and also information technology, thereby curbing the illegal migration that the young people go through the deadly seas. So we believe that if they stay in their communities, they'll believe in themselves with skills that are marketable to be able to work and earn for themselves. Gainville have trained over 6,000 young people across the country. 80% of those young people are gainfully employed. Gainfully employed in the sense that they create their own jobs because the skills they do are skills that are demand-driven. People need these skills all the time. We have people, who, young people who work for themselves more. With the success that we've registered, we've had so many awards, internationally and nationally. We've been awarded the Woman Champion by GCI in 2018. Recently, we've received an award as Sea Achiever in Education in Ethiopia by the Africa Women Awards. And also another excellent award by the NCAC and the Association of Women in Arts. We've also have awards in Nigeria, awards in the Gambia, and the most prestigious award that I can talk about is was the award that I have from UNTAD, the United Nations Trade and Conference and Development in 2016 as a woman social change, which was really motivating and challenging for me to do more and add value to the livelihood of our young people, add value to the national safety and security of our country by giving them skills. To excel. The partners that we work with in order to achieve our goals in empowering young people are the United Nations, the Youth Empowerment Project, yep, EU Delegation of the Gambia, GCCI, the Ministry of Trade, the Ministry of Gender, the Ministry of Higher Education, Child Fund the Gambia. We've also worked with Prospect for Girls, worked with GIZ Gambia, we've worked with the National Quality Assurance Authority. NACA also are our implementing partners. And these are the people that we work with in order to empower these young people with the skills. So we thank them so much and appreciate the journey that we have with them in order to complement each other's efforts and then achieve our goals in empowering the young people of the country. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. We'll soon start the keynote address. We just need a couple of minutes to just take care of some technical difficulties, and then we should be ready to go. In the meantime, I